Hello, I'm Terry Christensen, and this is Valley Politics. Today, we'll catch up on the state of our county with Joe Sumidian, president of the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. Later in community news, Amy Nguyen will brief us on the work of the Vietnamese American Roundtable. And then on Where Are They Now, we continue our interview with Phil Trounstein, who was a reporter and later political editor of the Mercury News in the 1980s and 1990s. All this next on Valley Politics. Welcome everyone and welcome Supervisor Joe Simidian, President of the Board of Supervisors of Santa Clara County. What's it mean to you to be President? Well, it, it means uh, that there are some ceremonial duties which fortunately I enjoy. There are some administrative duties which uh, I'm happy to undertake. But mostly it, it means an opportunity to try and work with your colleagues to pursue a common agenda and perhaps to have a little more voice, for example being here with you today. Um, to articulate uh, the county's agenda and what we're trying to do on behalf of the 1.9 million folks who are here in Santa Clara County. Well, you did a good deal of that when you gave your State of the County address right. a few weeks ago um, with two major themes. The first theme was saying Santa Clara County should resist things that the President and the Congress are doing. Uh, what was that about? What, well, what, are, we, what are we resisting? It wasn't so much about the fact that we have to resist, although I did highlight that. What I was really trying to say is we've got to get beyond resistance, which is we can't let the resistance distract us from the important work we have to do. One of the things I worry about with the current administration and the current Congress is that we're, we're so focused on uh, the need, which I think is real, to sort of stand up and speak out and push back. But you know, I don't want to let that get in the way of the progress we need to be making. I mean, the, the best way to resist, quote unquote, is to do good work and push it forward. So part of what I was hoping to communicate in that State of the County address was, yeah, we got to stand up and speak out and push back. But as we're about that work, we, we need to be thinking about what is our agenda here, what is the sort of constructive progress we can make for folks in our county, and, and not let that other work uh, get in the way of the need to make progress on our own agenda. But that other work goes on. The county's participated yeah. in various lawsuits having to do with immigrant rights, gay and lesbian rights, uh, the Dreamers. That's right. And I mean, so it, means, on. it means we've got to step up our game because, uh, you know, on the one hand, as I say, I want us to keep doing the good work. On the other hand, we're not going to be able to do that if we don't push back. So, right. you know, <coughs> yes, we're part of this resistance. Uh, but beyond that, we got to keep doing the work, and that was really the theme of the comments, which was part hey, of what Trump seems to be all about is distracting us from everything exactly else so. and focusing on him. So this is a good good way to put yeah. it to resist, but also to move forward on the policies. One thing worries me about the resistance. I wonder if it worries you. Uh, the county's dependent on the feds for roughly 18 percent of the annual budget. Yeah. Are you at all nervous that by the policies of resistance, we could get less of that money? You know, I, I, I'm a practical guy, I'm a pragmatic guy, I understand that concern, but I, I also think um, we can't be intimidated from saying what needs to be said, doing what needs to be done. Uh, we'll have differences of opinion within our own county, we'll have differences of opinion on our own board, uh, but, you know, if we get to the point where we're afraid to do the right thing as we see it mm -hmm. uh, because we're worried there will be consequences, then uh, I think we're in a very bad place. So I, I, I certainly don't take that view in terms of the way I go about doing my work and I, I don't think the county has um, as a larger entity. The other big theme in your speech was partnerships. You, you talked about specific yeah. policy areas where the county needs to continue to move forward. Criminal justice, he health care, you, list, you listed half a dozen key policy areas. But uh, partnerships was a way you argued that could be done. So t explain yeah. that well, a little I, bit. You know, at the risk of stating the obvious, uh, and I guess I will <coughs> because it, it, it does seem to get overlooked so obvious, <laughs> we, we can do more if we pull more people uh, to any given effort. And so I described a half dozen different cases where I thought we had been able to make real progress on challenges facing the county, but only because we pulled people together. And uh, you know, there is, uh, particularly here in the Valley where we've got, you know, a culture of entrepreneurship, there's, there's a tendency sometimes 
to just sort of go off and do your thing, to go it alone. And my observation over the years is we can get so much more done if we pull other folks along. And, uh, it, you know, does that make it harder? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think Mayor Licardo in his state of the city uh, referenced the, the proverb, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. And, and that's really what I was trying to communicate, which is if we have big, complicated challenges that we want to address and master, we're only going to be able to get that done uh, by pulling other folks in. It isn't just a city, a county, yeah. a local nonprofit, a group of community folks. And you got to pull everybody together. Is it harder to do? Yeah. Does it require a greater degree of commitment, perhaps a longer period of time? Yeah. And, and I didn't say this explicitly, but I'll use this opportunity to say it explicitly. I thought it was important to strike the notion uh, or to hit the theme of partnership at a time when so much of what's happening at the national level <laughs> seems to be about dividing. Yeah. And, you know, I would argue that our country, our state, our region has been at its best when people pull together in common cause um, rather than when we have succumbed to calls at any level to let ourselves be divided. Give us some examples of areas where partnership has succeeded or where you think it can yeah. well, succeed. Well, you know, one of the examples I used in the state of the county is, as, as you know, I had a uh, the last mobile home park in Palo Alto, California, my hometown, was slated for a closure. The owner had a right to sell, wanted to sell, mm -hmm. uh, and yet I had 400 constituents, uh, Santa Clara County residents, uh, low-income folks who were about to lose their homes and literally be out on the street. And, you know, I quickly came to the conclusion, we can't let that happen. Uh, you know, that was an easy conclusion to come to. The tougher part is, <laughs> all right, so how do you keep that yeah. from happening? And, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, I'll spare you and your viewers the long story, but we ended up with the county pitching in, the city of Palo Alto pitching in, the housing authority of Santa Clara County pitching in, a nonprofit called Caritas that will end up actually money. The residents themselves, of course, the local media weighed in, 500 folks showed up at City Hall, a couple dozen former mayors and council members, dozen and a half school board members. I mean. All of these folks came together and said, look, I can't solve this on uh, my own, but I can do my part as part of a larger effort. Long story short, the improvements are underway at a community uh, mobile home park that is now uh, looking at renovation and excited about the future. Never could have happened if we just said, well, can the county do it? Probably not. Could the city do it? Probably not. But together, yeah, you can do good county things. County couldn't do it alone. No. Absolutely. And this was preserving affordable housing. That's, that's, right. that's a I mean, crucial I, element. Talking about 400 plus people yeah. in 117 units, the median household income for a family of four there was $35,000 wow. for the household. Yeah. And yet they're sending their kids to Palo Alto schools. They're enjoying the opportunities that being in Silicon Valley provides. You know, if they were out on the street, even with a relocation allowance, you know, they're gone to you know, halfway to hell and gone, frankly, uh, you know, as people describe their options to me. And that's affordable housing in Palo Alto, which... That's right. And yeah. I mean, so, so you've got folks who are paying $750, $800 a month in space rent who are literally a block away from $3 million homes. Well, you know, that's... I mean, when I was a kid growing up in the Valley, this was a place that was all about opportunity. I was a teacher's kid. My classmate was the custodian's kid, the mechanic's kid. And mm -hmm. we went to the same great high school Alto, that, yeah. that the CEO of Hewlett Packard, yeah. Bill Hewlett, sent his kids to. Well, you know, I, those days may have come and gone, but I'd like to hang on to as much of that opportunity for the next generations as we possibly can. Moving forward, what's an example of a partnership you're looking to develop <laughs> to address some of the county's problems and yeah, issues? Yeah, you know, I think um, uh, it's an issue that is specific to my part of the county, but. Um, Stanford University has come forward and said, look, time for us to uh, re-up on our development plans for the future, mm -hmm. and they want to see 2,275,000 square feet. Uh, that's Yes, that's a lot. 2,275,000 uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> square feet of development authorized plus 3,150 housing units. I mean, taken together, this is larger than the Apple, new Apple spaceship campus, as an example, or you know, wow. bigger than the Empire State Building, wow. whatever yeah. uh, works. And, you know, what I've said is, look, this, this is not just about one application for development. We've got to ask ourselves, you know, can you be part of a larger set of solutions? Because the people I talk to say, we want to see that university prosper. We want to see right. it continue to be part of the economic uh, success of our value. But we want to make sure that housing gets addressed, traffic gets addressed, foothills are protected. Well, 
you know, can we expect the university to do all of that by itself? I don't think we can. Can we expect them to do their part to mitigate the impacts of their development? We can. Will it involve other agencies cooperating? It absolutely will. Yeah, this actually goes over county borders into it's San Mateo you, County. You, yeah, it's city and, of and when you said Park. partnerships. It turns out that there are six different governments that regulate some piece of the 8,000 acres that is Stanford land. Hmm. So it, we don't work cooperatively and collaboratively with them. We're only going to see a piece of the challenge and we'll only solve a part of the problem. So we've got to work in partnership with others. So does the university. Uh, do I think we can get end up with a good outcome for both the university and the region? I do. But not if we all think, well, I'll just stay in my lane and take my little piece of it. We've got to work more broadly. So the two big themes were resist and partnerships, but that seemed a little contradictory. So you're resisting the federal government well, and partnering I, with I everybody else. I would say else. my two big themes were progress okay. and partnerships, okay. and that um, that the, and the way I tried to link the two together was to say I think we only make progress if we partner with others. So, it, you know, we're um, we've got a modest little pilot project in the West Valley going on, for example, for seniors called Ride Reach Your Destination mm -hmm. Easily. Well. Five different cities pitched in on the funding. So did VTA, VTA the Valley Transportation yeah. Authority. So did the county. Uh, two nonprofits are actually running. Well, all of a sudden, you know, you've got literally nine different partners who are making rides available to West Valley seniors who otherwise, frankly, had limited options. Was it a challenge to herd all those folks together and get everybody moving in the same direction? It was. It still is. But we're making progress. And again, I think. You know, if you want to do more, you have to pull more partners in. So I would say that the themes of the State of the County Address were really progress and partnership and the indispensability of partners to making the kind of progress I want to see us make even as we do what we do have to do. Do you think the do. federal government's ever going to be a partner for you? I, I do, but not in the foreseeable future. <laughs> I, and um, you know, Has look, been in the past. It, oh, it absolutely yeah. has been. And look, this isn't just about you know, different parties or um, different ideologies, uh, we're in a very different time in American politics. And that's why, as I say, I think the notion of partnership is particularly important, never mind what party you are, never mind what your ideology might be. The, the need to pull together and to find, you know, common purpose and common ground and bring people together around that, even as people who have been marginalized or diminished say, wait a minute, I've got a particular issue that's important to me or my community or mm -hmm. my segment of the community. Um, you know, in, in Indian politics and government, they have a concept called unity and diversity. And it's a way of reflecting the fact that even as you have an overarching common sense of purpose or citizenship, that people get to be who they are and address their own individual agendas but there's nothing inconsistent about that with this overarching shared purpose. We've got to get back to a shared sense of values that pulls everybody into the effort while still letting people be who they are and um, see themselves the way they want to see themselves. Good. Good. One more thing about the state of the county. Sure. The fiscal state of the county is always yeah. a concern year to year. What's it look like for the coming year? You know, we're, we're um, every year, uh, in the five years that I've been back on the board since I was in the California State Legislature, uh, I, I would say the state of the county has been um, strong but anxious because, you know, what we don't know is what's going to happen with the federal government. What we don't know is will the good times suddenly come to an end. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, the, the cliche is we all know there's going to be another recession. We just don't know when. Um, so we've, we've had good growth economically uh, here in the value that, Valley. That has benefited the county uh, over the last five years that I've been back on the board. Things are good at the moment, uh, but, you know, we always want to plan for an uncertain future, and I think that's, um, you know, it's not a terribly satisfying answer, but it happens to be <laughs> the, the state of affairs as yeah. they really are. Yeah, could be worse. Oh, absolutely. Pretty, no, we've, it's pretty good. We've had, in the last five years, we've had, uh, you know, growth in our county budget and uh, that's allowed us to come back from the tough cuts that were made during the recession. Uh, that's allowed us to do more for people who really do need the help and services that the county provides. Uh, but uh, we're all anxious that uh, at some point uh, we may have the rug pulled out from under us and need to plan accordingly. We have just a couple minutes left, sure. but I want to hear um, about your trip to Trump country. Ah, yeah. Why'd you go? What'd you learn? Well, you know, in the immediate aftermath of the election, I said something important just happened, and boy, was it a surprise to a lot of us here in California, because you had 46% of the American electorate who voted for Donald Trump, 
um, you know, here in California, it was just 32%. Yeah. Here in Santa Clara County, it was just 21%. And in my hometown of Palo Alto, it was 12%. <laughs> so I thought, all right, folks see this world very differently. Yeah. What's that about? And while, you know, part of it was about the candidates, part of it was about the perception of the Democratic Party nationally, I went off to three different counties that had historically voted for Democrats, including Barack Obama, but that flipped and voted for Donald Trump. And what I'll tell you is, I went to places, as it turns out, that had had not just years, but decades of economic deprivation. And they were out of time and they were out of patience. And they said so in a way that they hoped was loud and clear. So, you know, putting aside, you know, there are lots of other factors in an election on a national level. But the, the part that I really was um, face to face with was, you know, it wasn't just about 2016. It wasn't even about the lingering after effects of the 2008 recession. These are people who for generations now have been trying to claw their way back to a place of opportunity and it hasn't happened for them. And they have given up on government and they have given up on politicians. And uh, in this case, it was a good swift kick in the pants in their view uh, that people needed to get in order to understand what they were feeling. One of the counties you went to, the one in North Carolina, Robeson yeah. County. Yeah. I studied the war on poverty there ah. in the late 1960s. Yeah. So that's how long exactly. those sorts of conditions and they, have existed. And they had tobacco, which is gone. Yeah. Then they had textile Textiles, jobs, which are gone. gone. And when I tell people, Robinson County, the place you're talking about, 70% Native American, African American, and Latino. Yeah. Poorest county or one of the poorest counties, at any, depending, in all of North Carolina. And Democrats outnumber Republicans five to one, <laughs> and they voted for Donald Trump. Yeah. Now that tells you that something's going on in the country, and I thought it was important to understand that. You think it was more class than race? Uh, well, you know, look, race is, uh, you know, interwoven, but I think this was more about lack of opportunity, and people yeah. gave up. They just said, yeah. look, you know, I used to have a good life. Today I don't. I don't see it in my future. When are you people in government going to figure it out? And as they say, they thought that Donald Trump was the good swift kick in the pants that you know the system needed in their view. In our last few seconds, sure. Can you give us? Can you recommend a movie or a book you've enjoyed that other people should enjoy? Well, you know, I um, uh, I don't want to be uh, you know too wonky here, but I guess on the book front, uh, I spent a lot of time this last year reading books like *Strangers in Their Own Land*, uh, *The Politics of Resentment*, *White Working Class* trying to understand what's yeah. been going on. So if you can't take the trips to the three counties, yeah. you know, any one of those three books or others like them, um, I think are Hillbilly worth Hillbilly Elegy is another good Hillbilly one. Hillbilly Elegy yeah. is another one. Yeah. Joe Samidian, thank you very much. All right, there's your homework assignment. All right. Thanks. Now it's time for community news with Amy Nguyen of the Vietnamese American Roundtable. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Nguyen, the treasurer of the Vietnamese American Roundtable, also known as VAR. VAR envisions a strong and unified Vietnamese American community that works towards improving the quality of life for all. We are community volunteers who work collaboratively to research, develop, promote, and support programs and projects that benefit the local community. As Vietnamese Americans spanning different generations, we are able to bridge both aspects of Vietnamese and American culture and lifestyle, which helps us bring inclusive perspectives to our events. Our mission is to mobilize, advocate, and inform our community of the critical issues that impact our lives. We accomplish this through building coalitions, strategic advocacy, and organizing meaningful community events for all. Our events span cultural education, civic workshops and forums, youth engagement, and professional development. One of our mainstays is our upcoming Black April commemoration on April 30th, a day where we reflect on the fall of Saigon, our struggles to survive and thrive in America, and what we can still do to better our communities. We also organize informational forums and workshops, such as voter information and legal rights. We focus our programming on critical and timely issues that directly impact our community. We participate in voter registration drives and seek to increase civic participation in our local government. We also create fun family events to celebrate both American and Vietnamese holidays. By volunteering with us, young leaders develop useful skills such as public speaking, communication, and community activism. We want the local communities to know who we are and what we do. 
Our events are planned and coordinated on 100% volunteer time. You can support us by collaborating with us, volunteering, and attending our events. You can contact us by email or adding us on Facebook, and you can also follow us on Twitter. We hope to see you at our next event. Now let's go back to our interview with Phil Traunstein. In this segment, he talks about his in-depth 1980 and 1990 studies of political power in San Jose, and then later his time as Director of Communications for Governor Gray Davis. Here's Phil. Now I'm going to get all the way up to 1980. Okay. All the way up to 1980, because that's a big year in your career, uh, I think, and certainly in what the Mercury did. That's the year they let you go for six or eight weeks on a single story uh, studying the power structure of right. San Jose. Right. I suspect they were curious what it was, because a lot of the, your executives at the Merc were new. Right. But tell us, tell us about the study. Well, I had done a similar study when I was at the Indianapolis in Star. Indianapolis, yeah. And, um, what I did was I took the model that Floyd Hunter, famous sociologist, and where did you learn about that? And I learned about that in Terry Christensen's <laughs> urban <laughs> politics class. And so Floyd Hunter had done this study of Atlanta in 1954, where he developed what he called the reputational model. And the idea was to find a group of people who are, because of their position, are well informed. And you go to them and you ask them if a project were before the community, that required a, de a decision by a group of leaders which 10 could put it over. Mm -hmm. And then these people would come up. And then you go to the people who emerge in that list yeah. and you ask them which three could put it over. And it's all off the record, so everybody gets to, uh, all these people get to be quite candid about what they think of the other people. So you, I'm talking to David Packard and he's telling me what he thinks of Janet Gray Hayes and Rod Dearden. And I'm talking, you know, to Cliff Swenson, the builder, and he's telling me what he thinks of uh, Phil Hammer or, or uh, uh, Conrad Rushing. And so all these different folks um, get asked these questions, and then eventually you develop uh, a list of however many you decide. We did the top 10 as a first tier, mm -hmm. and then we did 20 as a second tier. Um, and then we did profiles of each of those people. And what it revealed was who, in terms of their reputation, were the people seen as the movers and shakers in yeah. the city of San Jose. And um, it's been tried in broader areas, but you really need a contained area yeah. that has a defined uh, uh, sphere of influence to, uh, to look at. And so San Jose is a perfect model. And what we found was, um, as opposed to um, the uh, old eastern cities, which had a lot of business people, there were, in fact, because it was a western city, more public officials yeah. that were involved. You still had David Packard, who wasn't even didn't even live in San Jose, right, right. who was in the top ten. He's all the way up in Palo Alto. But the truth was, if David Packard and Janet Gray Hayes and Tony Ritter, who was the publisher of the Mercury News at the time, if the three of them decided they wanted to do something, it got done. Proof of that was when Tom McHenry and David Packard and Tony Ritter got together and decided to do something. That's how you got the Tech Museum of Innovation. Mm -hmm. That's how it happened. They stole it away from the, from the uh, Junior League of Palo Alto and put it in downtown <laughs> San Jose. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and you replicated the study in 1990. Right. Did it again. In that year, it was somewhat different. In that year, by then, the Mercury News had become so powerful, Tony Ritter was what Floyd Hunter used to call a star so isolate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he was, he was in a category by himself. Um, and there were still uh, Larry Jenks, I think, uh, of the Mercury News, and a couple other folks were important. But really, the Mercury News' power was so great at that point that uh, Ritter was by himself. And I, I think also in the 1990s study, you found more turnover right. in the top 10 and top 40 than you found in Indianapolis, That's for right. example. The older cities have more stable power structures. San Jose and other Sunbelt cities, more turnover. More turnover. Well, there are 
the same old institutions. Yeah. You know, if you and you old know, families. Yeah, and old families. I mean, and, uh, I think San Francisco would be very different, for yeah. example, yeah. because there's some really old, old families with a lot of money who go back for generations. San Jose doesn't have that, and in fact, some of the big business, some of the biggest businesses in San Jose, the people who run them don't live in San Jose. They right. don't really much care about right. San Jose. Right. They they live in Los Gatos or they live in in, uh, in uh, Atherton. And of course, in 1982, you and I made these studies, the first study, into a very famous book. That's right. Called Movers and, Movers Shakers, and Shakers, which you can still find used it, on Amazon. That's right. Right. And it's still taught in some political science yeah, classes. It's, it's a study, classic. That study. <laughs> it is a classic, actually, yeah. because what it does is it it takes a hunter's model and shows how it's usable. Uh, yeah, you really wrote a cookbook. Yeah, a cookbook on how to, how do, to do it. it. Yeah. yeah. Well, what about other big stories you covered? Redevelopment, the McHenry election in 82? Redevelopment was a big deal. Uh, I remember going to redevelopment meetings um, early on where they were just sort of beginning to plan what downtown should look like. and Still uh, working on it. And they're still working on <laughs> it. Well, but when McHenry came along and got elected to, got appointed first and then elected the city council, suddenly you had a genuine advocate for building up downtown um, on the city council. And the importance of that, particularly if you're interested in growth, is the notion was build up downtown and restrict growth uh, on, the, on the exterior, uh, out in the suburbs, so that you force this concentration of wealth and, um, and interest in the center city. And that helps control growth, it's more efficient, and it creates the possibility of a cultural mix in the center of town McHenry actually believed in this. Now, his family held property on San Pedro Square, um, and so some people thought that was a huge conflict of interest. You know, I don't think he ever did anything to directly benefit his own property. I don't think Tom was a double-dealing guy, but he really believed in downtown. You went on to be Governor Gray Davis's communications director. I did. What was it like to change sides from reporting well, it was, it to... Was, it, 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 was, it was a challenge. Um, uh, I, as a communications director for, for Davis, I was in charge of 13 state agencies and 60 state departments, all their public affairs. And what I told, and I had a direct staff that was in charge of his press, his advance, his schedule, um, and all his speech writing. And so it was a big job. My, what I told my people was, the best spin is true. <laughs> that never lie to reporters. What a concept. Never lie to reporters, and you tell the truth. Obviously, your job in that situation is to try to put the best spin on what you do, on on what your guy is doing. But um, really good public relations. And the Obama administration was good at this. Doesn't lie. They just tell the story the way they'd like it to be told. Finally, quickly, what's going on with your blog, Calbuzz? Calbuzz is still alive. But uh, my partner, Jerry Roberts, who was the former political editor at The Chronicle when I was political editor at The Mercury, he, is, um, he and I have basically taken a sabbatical, so occasionally we, we post. But we can still follow you on CalBuzz, you at least You can still go to CalBuzz.com, and uh, uh, from time to time we post something new. Great. Phil Trounstein, thanks very much for being with us today. My pleasure. It was Tom. great. That was part two of our interview with Phil Trounstein. You can catch part one on last month's show. Then we'll be back next month with our election preview. Meanwhile, you can catch up on previous shows on our website at createtvsj.org or on YouTube by searching for Create TV San Jose. And you can let us know what you think about our show and suggest future topics or guests by email at valleypolitics at createtvsj.org on Twitter at Valley underscore politics, and by following us on Facebook. And now that's all, folks. Thanks for watching Valley Politics today. See you next time.